In the next few minutes, we'll review the current evidence for the clinical presentation, etiology, testing, and treatment for children with community-acquired pneumonia. Community-acquired pneumonia is a common reason for children to present to medical attention and accounts for nearly 2 million outpatient visits annually. Signs and symptoms can include fever, cough, increased work of breathing, such as dyspnea, retractions, or grunting, fast breathing, also known as tachypnea, hypoxemia, abdominal pain, or lethargy. Physical exam findings can include decreased breath sounds, crackles, rails, or wheezing. Many signs and symptoms commonly seen in pneumonia overlap with other acute lower respiratory tract diseases, such as asthma and viral bronchiolitis. Two recent studies published in Pediatrics and JAMA in August of 2017 evaluated the reliability of physical exam findings in children with suspected pneumonia, and both had pretty impressive findings. The first study, by Florin et al., published in Pediatrics, was a prospective cohort study of children with suspected pneumonia. Two clinicians performed independent exams and completed forms reporting their exam findings. Surprisingly, none of them had findings with substantial agreement between the two clinicians and only respiratory rate, retractions, and wheezing had acceptable levels of reliability between providers. The second study by Shaw et al. was published in JAMA and was a systematic review examining accuracy of symptoms and physical exam findings and identifying children with radiographic pneumonia. They evaluated 23 prospective cohort studies of children with possible pneumonia, giving a combined total sample size of 13,833 children and found that no single symptom was strongly associated with pneumonia. However, the presence of moderate hypoxemia, defined as oxygen saturation less than 96%, and increased work of breathing, like grunting, flaring, or retractions, were most often associated with pneumonia. In fact, the presence of a normal oxygen level even decreased the likelihood of pneumonia. The most striking aspect of the study was that the usual signs and symptoms we are all taught in school, like fever and tachypnea, were not strongly associated with a diagnosis of pneumonia. So what organisms cause community-acquired pneumonia, and what are we targeting when we treat with antibiotics? Well, thanks to widespread vaccination against Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenza, viral pathogens are by far the most common cause of pediatric community-acquired pneumonia. In a recent study of hospitalized children with pneumonia, the CDC etiology of pneumonia in the community or EPIC trial, viruses were identified in more than 70% of children, whereas bacteria were identified in only 15%. However, other studies have shown that up to 30% of patients with known viral infection, especially influenza viruses, can have a coexisting bacterial pneumonia. Streptococcus pneumonia is the most common cause of typical bacterial pneumonia, and this is the bacteria that we target with first-line antibiotics for treating pneumonia. Other less common bacterial causes are Haemophilus influenza and Moraxella cateralis. Because these bacteria so uncommonly cause pneumonia, empiric coverage is not warranted in most patients. Staph aureus and group A strep are usually associated with a more severe disease and can cause complications like paraneumonic effusion or empyema. Mycoplasma pneumoniae, the common cause of atypical or walking pneumonia, can actually cause either diffuse or lobar pneumonia, and this bacterial is difficult to distinguish from more typical pathogens like strep pneumoniae based on physical exam and lab findings. It's more commonly identified in children older than five years of age and very rarely causes disease in younger children. What sort of testing should a child with suspected community-acquired pneumonia have? We commonly think of chest x-rays as an aid in diagnosing pneumonia, but the 2011 guideline developed by the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society and the Infectious Diseases Society of America actually discourages use of chest x-rays in children with suspected uncomplicated pneumonia in the outpatient setting. So the large majority of patients with suspected pneumonia likely do not need a chest x-ray. Chest x-rays are recommended in children who are hospitalized with hypoxemia or respiratory distress and in those with suspected complications such as paraneumonic effusions, necrotizing pneumonia, or pneumothorax. Most children with community-acquired pneumonia who are treated on an outpatient basis do not need any labs drawn. Labs that should be considered for all patients ill enough to be hospitalized include blood cultures, CBC with differential, 
and some also recommend nasopharyngeal PCR for viruses. Blood cultures should not be performed on outpatients or hospitalized patients with uncomplicated disease, as they are generally only positive in 2 to 7% of this population. They are more likely to be positive in patients with complications such as perineumonic effusion, with rates ranging from 10 to 35%. A recent study published in September 2017 in Pediatrics by Newman et al. sought to determine the prevalence of bacteremia among children hospitalized with community-acquired pneumonia in a non-ICU setting. In this cross-sectional study, only 2.5% of a total of 7,509 children who had blood cultures drawn had a positive blood culture. The most common pathogen isolated was strep pneumonia. Flu testing should be considered in groups at high risk for severe disease, including children younger than two years of age, pregnant women, people with underlying medical conditions such as chronic lung disease, including asthma, heart disease, renal disease, metabolic disorders or hematologic disease, or neurologic disease. People taking immunosuppressive medications and those with morbid obesity are also considered high risk. These groups are also the patients who would benefit from antiviral treatment for flu. For a full list on high-risk groups and further resources on flu testing and treatment, refer to the CDC's influenza website, which is updated on a regular basis to reflect the latest findings and recommendations. As noted previously, the majority of cases of pneumonia in children are caused by viruses. Therefore, it is reasonable to withhold antibiotic therapy if viral pneumonia is suspected, especially in patients who are mildly ill, have clinical evidence suggesting viral infection like rhinorrhea or sneezing, and are not in respiratory distress. This is especially important because at least 30% of all outpatient antibiotic prescriptions are inappropriate, many of which are written for upper respiratory tract infections. For mildly ill children with concerns for bacterial pneumonia but who do not require hospitalization, the recommended antibiotic treatment is amoxicillin at 90 mg per kilogram per day divided into doses administered two to three times daily for a seven to 10 day course. The bacteria primarily targeted with this antibiotic choice is Streptococcus pneumoniae, which makes sense based on the varying clinical causes of pneumonia we discussed earlier. Consider clindamycin or vancomycin if you're concerned about staphylococcal pneumonia, such as in patients with pneumatoceles or empyema, and these patients should also be referred to the hospital. Ongoing and newer studies show that antibiotic courses shorter than 7 to 10 days may have just as good of cure rates, so stay tuned for changing recommendations with regards to treatment duration over the next few years. When indicated, antiviral treatment with Tamiflu should be added to the treatment regimen, and should start as soon as the diagnosis of flu is considered. Practitioners commonly believe that oral cephalosporins are better than amoxicillin for strep pneumonia, but this is not actually the case. Oral cephalosporins have short lives, are not well absorbed by the GI tract, and are highly protein bound and often dosed at long intervals, which results in serum concentrations that do not provide enough killing time to treat more resistant strains of strep pneumonia. Finally, the benefits of treatment of community-acquired pneumonia due to mycoplasma are controversial and are likely not warranted in the outpatient setting. Overtreatment, especially in adults, has led to overuse of azithromycin. Some suggest that treatment should be reserved for patients who are admitted to the hospital and who have rapid diagnostic testing that confirms the diagnosis of mycoplasma. In general, consider hospital referral for young children very ill-appearing children or children who do not respond to appropriate outpatient therapy or cannot tolerate it due to vomiting. A patient should be considered to have failed outpatient antimicrobial therapy when clinical worsening occurs despite 48 hours of properly chosen and dosed antimicrobial agents. Children who are immunocompromised and those with sickle cell anemia and acute chest syndrome also warrant a referral to the hospital. Complicated pneumonia is a somewhat broad term, but often indicates the presence of a pleural effusion, empyema, abscess, bronchopleural fistula, necrotizing pneumonia, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Social factors, such as the ability of caregivers to appropriately administer medications at home, should also be considered when deciding whether or not to hospitalize a child with community-acquired pneumonia. It is often difficult to distinguish bacterial versus viral community-acquired pneumonia in the outpatient setting, especially based on history and physical exam alone. 
One clue to, de to determine the cause of pneumonia can include duration of symptoms. Anecdotally, fever that lasts more than two to three days and is unresponsive to antipyretics is more consistent with bacterial pneumonia. History consistent with rhinorrhea and sneezing is also is consistent with viral pneumonia. Wheezing is often attributed to atypical bacterial causes such as mycoplasma or viral causes of pneumonia. Rapid viral diagnostics such as PCR or immunofluorescence testing can be helpful in identifying viruses if present. However, remember that up to 30% of patients with known viral infection can have coexisting bacterial pneumonia, so it's important to look at the whole clinical picture. If you remember nothing else from this short talk, remember the following points. It is difficult to clinically diagnose community-acquired pneumonia, but hypoxemia and respiratory distress are the most reliable clinical signs. Viruses most commonly cause community-acquired pneumonia in pediatric patients, so children with mild disease may not need antibiotic treatment. When bacterial pneumonia is suspected, the recommended empiric antibiotic treatment is amoxicillin, dosed at 90 mg per kilogram per day, divided in 2 to 3 doses per day. This antibiotic primarily targets strep pneumonia, which is the most common bacterial cause of community-acquired pneumonia in children. Azithromycin, which is commonly prescribed, is actually not as good as amoxicillin for treating strep pneumonia. Finally, consider hospital referral for children younger than six months of age, those who do not respond to outpatient antibiotics, those who cannot tolerate oral antibiotics, or those who are toxic appearing.